Hello and welcome to the No No Never podcast. I am your host, Natalie Bromley. Do not adjust your television sets or your microphones. I am here. I've been skiving for a couple of weeks, so my thanks go to the team at No No Never for filling in in my absence. But I'm back at the helm, and this week we are looking back at that hard-fought point at home against Wolves on Tuesday. What does that mean for Burnley's survival hopes? And we look ahead to a crunch game at the bottom of the table against Everton. I am joined by regular analyst and FPL expert Adam Dennett and, of course, the main man himself, the absolute creator of the previous show and the oracle of all things Fountain Brew, it's Dave Statman Roberts. So let's put our hats on, buckle up and let's go. Gentlemen, welcome. How did you call Dave? How was the previous show without me? I'm sorry, I've been skiving a couple of episodes. How did? How are you, sir? Yeah, I've forgotten what you look like. Um, or sounded and sounded like for those listening. Yes. Uh, yeah, me and, me and Tom got by. We well, Tom and Adam and everyone chipping in and. Uh, you did more than yeah. get by. I listened to the episodes; they were very good. So do don't don't be, don't be giving me that. I had to come back this week. I was worried I was going to be booted off and out of a job. God, I'm getting tied up in my headphones here i was worried i was going to get booted off and, and have no job left i had to come back and protect my position otherwise i uh, would have been gone um but yes thank you both of you um adam how are you yeah good i think i think we've i don't want to throw throw a spanner in the words but i think we've been unbeaten in the uh in the preview shows that uh that you've missed i know so <laughs> when we lose the weekend that and compared to spectacular performance by my colleagues i feel like i might be out of a job come monday so Absolutely. listeners it's been a good run we've had 13 years so you know, of my dulcet tones on uh, the the none ever previous show. It's been uh, it's been great knowing you all. Um, Adam, let's come to you first. We've got quite a lot to cover in this week's show, but I'm going to drive right into that crunch game at Turf Moor on Tuesday night. Um, some unexpected results for us last weekend. Um, a very hard fought point away at Chelsea, and suddenly we found ourselves staring at what would possibly be one of the greatest escapes in Premier League history. Suddenly, four points behind, and uh, looking like if results went our way, we could have finished the game on Tuesday night with just one point clear of safety. Wasn't meant to be. Results didn't go our way. Forrest, particularly Chris Wood, the pesky little things, decided to do a very good win. Um, Everton had a late equaliser, and uh, we failed to beat Wolves at home. So it all felt a little bit deflated. Um, Did it feel to you at the end of the game that that was a bit, Mm, that's it. I know the players were on the floor, but I very much put that down to um, a very hard put, put performance rather than any dejected views. How did you feel firstly at the end of that game? Yeah, I think you, you couldn't help but feel slightly disappointed and um, and a bit of an opportunity missed. Um, but I just, yeah, disappointment in the main, but only because of... Um, the positive result at Chelsea and you felt like we we're really gaining some momentum and there were a real chance to get ourselves well back in the in the hunt on Tuesday. Um I don't think I still th- well sorry I still think we at least are becoming well we have have become a lot more competitive. Yes. The weeks which was again on show on on Tuesday night or the night we could have got all three points but um I think Wolves were good value for for the draw at the end. Um shame we couldn't couldn't have capitalised, but we're still in a lot better position than we were um, after those Arsenal and Palace games. So still some room for optimism. Yeah, I think I think that's true. Um, I guess let's start with that then, because the one, well, there's two constants that have been in play since we had that four game uh, unbeaten run, one of which is the reintroduction of Josh Cullum in midfield, who seems to have very much put those poor performances at the beginning of the season to one side and is is back to the player we knew and loved from last season. We've been beating this drum for a long time now on the Known and Ever podcast, but just I'm so frustrated, Adam, about what could have been this season if Vincent Kupnir had put Muric in a long time ago. Because again, he was spectacular. And some of those passes that he was making were absolutely outrageous from any keeper of any level. They were he's, he's made such a difference. And like you said, again, it's just a feeling of frustration that we haven't got to um give, well giving our sense ourselves a lot better chance with it with him coming in when he should have done in probably September, October, even November. Yeah. Um but it's great to have him back. Um gets the heart pumping at times, but um <laughs> but 
I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't. At least two or three times again. I really appreciate it. Now he's been out of the side for a while, but um, but yeah, he does make such a difference. We look so much more confident, um, and we just really we look so much more dangerous. Even our goal of the night came from um, Murich playing to O'Shea yeah. cross the ball in, and it's just playing out, playing out so much better, um, so much quicker, and with so much more quality from the back. It's night and day from from where we were. Um, yeah. Like you said, it's it's just what what might have been. What might have been? I think that's that's where I was most frustrated. at, don't you think, Dave? I think it's it's a hard league anyway, and to not give yourself the best possible chance that you can have. I don't know how you would have done this, but at the end of the day, company has got every right at the beginning of the season to decide that he doesn't think that Murich is a Premier League goalkeeper. Maybe there was a few rumours of some disciplinary issues. Maybe there was that that concerned. Maybe he was just worried generally. He's well within his rights to bring in another player. But after five games, it was blatantly obvious that James Trafford wasn't in that position. So why would you have put, just like, why would not would you have done this? Just like swap around and say, right, okay, Mewich, you've got now five games. Let's see what you can do. And then assess them rather than wait until nine games before the end of the season. Is that naive, do you think, on my part? Is it that simple? I'm I'm not sure, I'm not hundred percent sure on that. I think it's 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 one of those that with hindsight, yeah, it's the decision. I think he he would maybe be kicking himself saying that that's the case. But when you're kind of in there week after week, and it's yeah. he sees the players in training. Don't forget that's that's the other thing that we we don't see. We we kind of get there, turn up at, at three o'clock on a Saturday and or two o'clock when the teams announce, and and that's what we see. Whereas obviously the managers seeing the players week in week out, but. Yeah, from from the outside looking in, it does did look like a strange one, um, and we are beginning to see the, the the fruits of it. Whether that would have been the case earlier in the season, I don't know. It's it's a case of the players come in now. He's really got the bit between his teeth and is taking that chance. Um, and let's hope that continues. Obviously, we've got some important games coming up. Uh, obviously, starting with uh, with Saturday, and they'd be coming. It's all very well saying we're unbeaten oh. before. Are you going to say, it, Dave? Are they, are they, what are we going to say? Getting to the point where, yeah, Sat- Saturday is pretty much uh, getting towards a must win, isn't it? Yeah. 13 years <laughs> since the podcast and we've finally got Dave to admit there's a must win game. Um, Adam, I think to me, one of the things that Newich brings to the side is that leader that we've been missing and we've been talking about for a long time. It's been a side that's been quite introverted and quite shy and quite, not quite sure of itself. It's a young, young, inexperienced side. And whilst Murich is hardly a veteran himself, he seems to lead from by example. And and I saw so many players who've been quiet so far, really like trying to get the the team up. Vitinho was. We'll talk about him in a minute, but he was trying to get the crowd going. And Murich just brings an air of authority, I think, to the game. Is could could he be a, a captain almost in that perspective? Yeah, we are lacking leadership. We've said it all season, haven't we? And um, and yeah, it's not just his um, it's not just his passing out from the back. I think some of the saves he's made since he's come back in have been fantastic as well. We maybe didn't see that as much last year when we've no. had uh, so much control in games. But yeah, the the chest pumping when he's when he's making those saves, you can see that the players just look so much more up for it. And we say it's, it won't all be down to just Murich coming to the side, but obviously the the performance levels of everyone just seems to have been lifted by him coming back in and the confidence of the defence. Yeah, it's it's definitely having an effect on the rest of the players because it, it does exude comf- uh, confidence with, like any time he plays. doesn't matter if we're playing well, not playing well. <laughs> he will still do what Murich does uh, regardless. And yeah, it, it breeds confidence when it's when it's going well. Um, I've said his crit- criticisms at points last season, uh, but... Yeah, at the moment it's um, let's just ride that train and hope we can uh, we can carry it on into Saturday and get yeah a must win. Yeah, definitely. I feel better facing Everton at the weekend with Murich in the nets rather than we did last time. It was a pretty poor performance when we were at home against them. So fingers crossed for something a little bit stronger. Um, Adam, let's stick throughout the team then before we come on to the the goal, particularly the equaliser, which is still irritating me to this to this moment. Um, Another player who seems to have had a real revival this under the past few games is is Vitinho. Um, been playing in midfield for us for a while, which is a role that has been relishing, and he's been pushed back to right back this week. 
with um, Asignon serving out his suspension for that ridiculous sending off against Chelsea. Um, I thought he was an absolute engine. That that boy can run forever. Like I've, I've never seen such pace on him. What do you think has given him that extra lift? Because he's another player at the beginning of the season has been criticised for being out of his depth, maybe, if we say yeah, his his confidence just seems seems through the roof at the moment. And, Unwavering, um, so. Yeah, he was like given a bit more license, maybe a bit further forward initially, but I think he's he's obviously shown his um, adaptability and um, and flexibility the last few weeks. He's played right wing, left back, um, right at, at Chelsea, right back um, the other night, and like you said, the he's just been fantastic. He's he's got a mistake in him, uh, which is always he always has done. Like when. He's, he's made up for his errors on some occasions, but at least he has done that. And yeah, he just, you can't, another one that it's just infectious. You, you, I love, I really enjoy watching him at the moment because he is just everywhere. And it is the energy again that we've, we've missed for so much of the season. Yeah. Um, yeah. Joy to watch. He, like you said before, getting the crowd up for it when, when we're getting a, he a did that a throw. few times, didn't he? Yeah, he yeah, did. He, and there was—I can't remember which one it was. Do you remember there was a there was a, it came out of nowhere and he tracked back and took the ball off one of the wolves forwards. I can't remember who it was. I was just like, where where has he come from? And he just did it. It wasn't it wasn't the slickest, and he just literally just took the ball off the wolves plane. Just did enough to make him second guess where it was. And I then yeah. I think maybe Taylor came in and took the ball and moved. And it was just it was near the the cricket field end. And I just thought, you know what? He was. It was between him and Sander Burge for me for man of the match on Tuesday. It was very close. I went for Burge in the end, but it was very close. Yeah, it's it's, it's fine margin really because like I think we've I've been on here and criticised Vitinho before when he's lunged in. Given, I think he's mm. given penalties away against Chelsea and Palace this season. Um, but again, his confidence looks through the roof at the moment, and things are going his way. Um, and yeah, it's. It's nice to have someone on on that form who looks confident, and he, he just seems to be really enjoying his football. Did an interview after the game the other day, and just seems to be really enjoying his football. His English is is so much. Well, it's come on a lot. Apparently, he couldn't yeah. speak English when he came over last season. So, oh really? Anything he's really really got got stuck in. I don't. I just saw one one person say that, so maybe that isn't the case. But, um, <laughs> yeah, it, that it, listeners it, is the extent of our research on the Northern <laughs> podcast. If somebody says on Twitter, we take it through yeah. and we report on it. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, joy, joy to watch it. <laughs> Good, um, Dave. We're gonna you're gonna kick us off with this one because I know both of us tweeted our disappointment to this. I think we both tweeted the same video as well. Um, posted whatever. It's not tweeted anymore. Is it posted? Second game running. Absolutely abysmal refereeing decision. That free kick that led to the Wolves' goal. What on earth? How could anybody with normal eyesight see that and give it as a free kick? We all knew in the stadium that it wasn't. We were on, it was right in front of us where I sat. We were on our feet screaming that it wasn't. Yes, we need to defend free kicks better, but my goodness, what an appalling decision. It was embarrassing, wasn't it? Yeah, the referee was in a, a fantastic position, really, to be fair to him. is only sort of five, six yards away. Um, quite how he's got that wrong, I don't know. And then, obviously, the three kicks come in. You're right, we haven't defended it. And disappointing just before half-time to concede. What was odd was the fact that there seemed to be a bit of uh, deliberation. Uh, they, they went to kick, uh, we went to kick off, and the referee kind of stopped it. And then we were wondering what was going on for a minute or so. There was some suggestion that were the VARs uh, looking at yeah. it to say whether it was the free kick. We'd love to hear the audio of that if the uh, PGMOL can be Is that uh, open something that the they can have a look at? I don't think there was something I'm, they could I'm, look at. I don't that, think that it is. Discussion, I don't know. I think they were. I think they were more looking at a possible offside. I think rather than anything else. I don't. I don't think. Out of it, or was there? No, I don't, I don't know what they were looking at, but I, I don't. Yeah, it was a very quick VAR review, so I think that might be it. But I don't, as far as I'm aware, they don't have the ability to to look back at something like that. There's a free kick um, that leads to a goal. I think that's that's down to. I'd be interested to see if we ever get any apologies from the referees' association for these things. I suspect not. We get a letter every week, don't we? Well, yeah, just pre-printed. Uh, ugh, drives me mad. Um, but Adam, aside from that, and yes, we have been on the receiving end of some pretty poor decisions recently. Um. But my gosh, that defender, just when I think we're getting a little bit stronger, they're defending for that free kick. I mean, it just, what what is going on? Yeah, we we quite often look, uh, 
like vulnerable from set pieces and obviously we can see a lot of goals from set pieces but um it's not like it was overpowering or um no. or it were a good bit of movement it's just like wandered into acres of space and nodded it into the corner and I know we've been singing his praises. Murich's positioning maybe slightly. Yeah, it wasn't great. Uh, slightly off, he's taken a step as if to come out and get it because he it has been coming and gobbling up everything at the moment and it's left that side of the goal exposed. But it was right in the corner. He might not have got there anyway, but it just meant that he got nowhere near it. Um, but yeah, really, really disappointing all all round to, to concede that goal. Um, but like we've just suggested, it's um, it should never have been, been the case. And... I think we just about edged the first half and would have been really big to go in at 1-0. We've conceded so many goals just before half-time this season, which might be some kind of mental block as well. But, um, yeah, really, really disappointing. Is it over for you, Adam? Is it still? No, not yet. I think this weekend's massive, like Dave's alluded to. If, if we do get the win this weekend, which I'm sure we'll come on to, um, in the preview show, then I think we we re- are still in with a, a decent chance with the points we've put on the board in the last few weeks. And um, but yeah, not not over for me. I'm still a lot Good. more positive than I was a few weeks ago. If you had to ask me one way or the other, I'd say we're more likely to go down than stay up. But um, we've we do have a chance, and this weekend massive. Yeah, I think the I think the current stats are suggesting that. Um... It's a 93% chance that we get relegated. Now, I'm a poker player, for those people who don't already know that. The amount of times where somebody's got 7% of me on the river card and it comes. So you never know. It could happen. <laughs> um, we need a meme here. We need a meme to say, so you're telling me there's a chance? There are many. Dumb and Dumber, one of the greatest <laughs> films ever made. So you're saying there's a chance. Right, I need to find that and insert that into the YouTube version of this this podcast. Uh, thanks for that, Dave. Very good. Um, where was I going to go with that? Uh, Dave, just remind I was thinking about this today. Remind me again, Everton still potentially have another points deduction, right? Uh, there was a hearing last week. There was some suggestion that it might be announced this week. It obviously still could. That would be, I think, a blow. Well, it could, could be a blow if, if they have got another points deduction. <laughs> And it, and it happens and announced on Friday before the game, um, and then that gives them a boost. Although last time it happened, they, they played uh, Man United. Didn't they went they? on they a lost, ridiculous so. run. No, but, but they also they went on a ridiculous run after they got that last points deduction. And, and like, I think within about three games, it was completely swallowed up. So let's not get too excited about points deductions. Let me get it next week. Um, Forest had done though, right? There's nothing else for them. It's just Everton now. Well, they, they've appealed, haven't they? Their 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 points deduction, but I think they got two points credit for. For the process anyway. Yeah, against, so, yeah, yeah, so it seems thing. silly. Um, okay, good stuff. Let's wrap that up there. Anything else you wanted to add other than the game in the summary, Adam, or are you are you done? No, I think uh, that pretty much pretty much covers it. Yeah, we have what we haven't talked about is the drama in the James Hargreaves. No. We all end up in the Mac. Yeah. Mm. That all piece of roof falling off. So if any of our listeners were in that section that got evacuated, we'd love to hear from you what happened. Um, definitely distracted me from the game for a little while. There's something about there's something about Tuesday night games under the lights and drama with roof, whether it's parachutists dropping on them or bits falling off them. It's uh, yeah, it's uh, we've got enough roof stories at Turf Moor. We don't need any more. Okay, listeners, that's it. That's as our summary of the Chelsea game. So we're gonna have a very quick break and we're gonna move on to previewing the Everton show. So moving on to the second half of this week's preview show, and we are looking ahead to a very important away tie at Everton this weekend. We've already discussed this in the first part of the preview show when we were looking back at that Wolves game. But this is a crunch game if Burnley have got any hopes of trying to survive this season. Dave has already said at the top of the show that this is now in must-win territory, which is something we don't get him to admit very often. Um, we're going to talk about the, 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 the um, game shortly, but at first we're going to hand over to Statman Dave, who is our expert in these fields and he's going to kick us off with his match results summary go ahead Dave yeah other than four matches that were played at Anfield which was the home of this weekend's opponents before the formation of their rivals Liverpool FC in 1892 all of our remaining 53 away trips to face Everton in the league have been at Goodison Park the only time we've faced the Toffees in the league outside the top flight 
That was in the 1930-31 season. All the rest have been top flight matches. Uh, Burnley have accumulated 10 away wins, as well as 14 draws, which means we suffered defeat in 33 of our previous away visits. The goal tallies stand at 66 to the Clarets and 110 to our hosts. Uh, eight previous Premier League away trips to Goodison Park have yet to produce a draw. Everton have been the victors on six occasions, with Burnley picking up two wins. And we'll keep you in suspense to discover which of those two victories will get the one to remember treatment when we come to the next section of the preview show. Well... That next section of the preview show is our one to remember and one to forget feature. Uh, it's, it's basically it's this season's version of memorable match. We, we call it this because we look at two very contrasting games. So Dave, why don't you take us all away with this, starting with the one to forget, please, after you've teased us. Uh, yeah, although we've suffered some heavier defeats at Goodison Park over the years, one of the most disappointing losses in recent times was in April 2015. We hadn't had the best of seasons in our first Premier League campaign with Sean Dyche in charge, but there was still hope as it was extremely tight towards the bottom of the table. Uh, a victory in this match would have lifted us out of the bottom three, but it wasn't to be on this occasion. Although Tom Heaton managed to save an 11th minute penalty from Ross Barkley after David Jones had fouled Aaron Lennon, the home side took the lead just before the half hour mark through Kevin Morales who managed to prod a shot past Tom Heaton at the second attempt. And then just before half-time, referee Mike Jones showed a second yellow card to Ashley Barnes for a foul on Seamus Coleman, meaning we would face an uphill battle with only 10 men for the whole of the second half. Despite our best attempts to get back into the game, there was no further score and our hopes of survival took another step backwards and the season ended with us making a swift return back to the Championship. Boo. OK, what's match two? What's the, what's the better one? OK, more positive uh, news. Uh, with two recent victories to choose from, we've opted to select the, not to select the 2-1 win from March 2021, which okay. numbers were there anyway. That was a behind-closed-doors match in which That's Chris, Wood, Chris Wood and Dwight McNeil scored our goals in the first half. And instead, we're going to take you back to the 1st of October 2017. After only picking up seven points away from home in the whole of the previous season, we surpassed that total and stayed unbeaten on our travels with a memorable 1-0 win at, the, at Goodison Park. To add to their opening day win at Champions Chelsea and a couple of creditable draws at Spurs and Liverpool. Uh, the Sky Sports cameras were at Goodison Park on the Sunday afternoon to see Sean Dyche pitting his wits against Ronald Koeman, who'd helped Everton to European qualification during his first season at the club. But the Clarets came out on top, thanks to a move that wouldn't have looked out of place in a Champions League match. The flowing 24-pass move was eventually finished off by Jeff Hendrick in the 21st minute, and we kept out the home side at the other end to earn another very valuable three points, and this also moved us up to sixth place in the table. The Burnley Express headline was, Toffees left in a sticky situation. Burnley became Barca at Goodison Park. <laughs> Koeman was sacked later that month, and as we know, Burnley went on to finish the season in seventh place to ensure our own European qualification. Excellent stuff. What a great memory in there. I love it. Uh, not often that you hear Burnley talked about in Barca terms, but Dave will manage to shoot on that in, in any one. OK, not my favourite topic of conversation at the moment, young Dave. But which Egypt's going to be in the middle referee in the game this week and what minute is he going to make his first howler on? <laughs> uh, well, 39 year old Michael Oliver of Ashington has been tasked with taking charge of this vital match on Saturday. He's refereed 26 previous Burnley matches. And although we've won eight of those, not too bad overall, we only have two victories in the last 15. That's covering the period since December 2017. The only time he's been in charge uh, for our, one of our matches so far this season, uh, that was the 3-1 defeat at Arsenal. Uh, as well as dismissing three Burnley players in previous matches, they were Chris Eagles, Michael Duff and Jeff Hendrick. A couple of opposition players have also been sent off uh, and both were in matches we went on to lose. Uh, they were Harry Maguire when he was at Leicester City and then Arsenal's Fabio Vieira in the match from early this season. Uh, however, Michael Oliver has shown more yellow cards to our opponents, 40, 
uh, compared with 36 shown to Burnley players. He's also refereed one of our previous matches against Everton. Uh, that was uh, not a good omen. That was Turf Moor on Boxing Day 2018 uh, when the visitors ran riot and won 5-1. Not that any of the blame can be attributed to the officials for that one. Uh, David Coote will be the video assistant referee on Saturday and he really needs to perform significantly better than his colleagues John Brooks and Chris Kavanagh, who were the last two uh, VARs for the last two Burnley matches. Yeah, no, I just, I've, I've got no time to at the moment. Adam, give us some good news. Um, I was a bit down in the dumps when I came off on Tuesday night and I did tweet this out. I did feel like we were maybe done. Um, it did feel to me like the end of the road on Tuesday night. You're more optimistic than you, so I'm going to let you take the lead on this. What are we going to do? Who's what are we going to do team wise? What are we going to do performance wise? Do how do we approach it differently away this time? Everton very much in need of of a of a win. They've not won at all this year, if I remember seeing that rightly, Dave. I don't know if they've won this year, have they? Is that uh, the third team are to win, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. So last, last time they won were at Turf Moor. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Well, we are usually quite accommodating with some of these teams when they need to, to break certain results for us. So, kick us off. How are you feeling about this game? Talk us through all your thoughts. Um, well, from you, you, there's not much to be optimistic about if you look at those two games that we've played them this season in isolation. Um, I were at Goodison Park earlier this season for the Cup game. And, yeah, there were a lot of, well, a few changes on both sides. Murich actually played for us that night, uh, but he didn't make uh, much of a difference. They pretty much bullied us from start to finish. Um, Tarkovsky scored and, and they scored another goal from a set piece in the second half. And I think we had our only shot on target in injury time. Right at the end, it were um, really a, an abysmal display. But um, And then the league game as well. Um, at home, I don't think we can be, have any arguments. And once again, it was very predictable the way that they, they scored the goals. They put a lot of pressure on us. High up the pitch, we shot ourselves in the foot and conceded set piece goal again. Um, I'm hoping, because both times we've played them um, earlier this season, they've been on a bit of a purple patch um, and, and on, on a good run and had, had some form of momentum, whereas this time it feels and like the other way around. We're four games unbeaten. We've not had that um, all season. They're on this horrific run. Pressure will start to, to play on them. I think they were right earlier if... I'd rather them not get the points deduction this side of the game to get the crowd up. Um, I'm sure the crowd will be up because they'll understand it's a very big game for them as well. But um, I think they're going to be coming into it with a lot more insecurities than they did in the previous two meetings. Um, we have looked a lot better defensively recently. Hopefully we've learned some lessons. Company has shown signs of learning the last few weeks after we've criticised him quite a lot of the season for not doing. And we've got, we've got, two recent games against them where we've got a lot to learn from and and hopefully we can uh, we can do that now. I'm not sure what, I, I wouldn't want to see what he did uh, the other night with Foster playing on the wing and Oda Bear in the centre. Uh, that didn't really seem to, I don't, I don't think they, they played badly in a way, but you just didn't know. Didn't really work, got, did it? They've got, yeah, they've got much more. I, I were expecting Foster and Fafana to be in the nine and ten positions. Yeah. I think we all did. And to be on the wing. Um, hopefully we might stick with the same because obviously we didn't, it wasn't a defeat the other night, but I'd like to see us um, probably still probably still start them too. Fafana probably needs hooking a bit earlier if he puts in a yeah, similar performance. Great. Um, he really didn't have a good night, but um, he's been mainly positive and a shining light since he's come in, so I don't want to be too critical of him. Probably well, I'm presuming I'm presuming Asinjong's going to come straight back in, and we'll have we'll he'll play Vitinho back up in midfield again this time. Yeah, potentially probably drop out there, maybe. Yeah, it's a good shout. It's yeah, it'd be interesting to see who does does drop out if if he does. does JBL because, was fantastic. Like, I, I wouldn't drop him. Uh, no, he's got yeah, he's he's been doing well recently. Got a couple of goals, but um, yeah, it might be one of Fafana and Foster that drop drop to the bench and, and move Vitinho forward again because, like we said earlier, I don't think we can. We can drop him, but the other—I think the other players pit themselves. We're going to be, yeah. um the back four of like you said, will be Aston Young coming in. As Steven O'Shea have done done really well recently. Hey. Cullen and Burge have looked the best that we've looked in central midfield. They are—they are, they are so our strongest midfield yeah. pairing, like by a long way. 
but yeah, I think that's hopefully the way we'll line up and hopefully we'll be stronger than we have been against them previously. And we need we need to get a result and find a way of causing them some problems because in the games that we've played against them, we've not caused them any any problems defensively either. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, Dave, any preferences for you, team-wise? Um, I think... I, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, it was a surprise to see the team sheet in some ways on mm. uh, on Tuesday. The fact that Fafana and uh, Foster were both playing, and then, as you say, the kind of formation we had didn't really no. match what we're expecting for it to go like. It's certainly not going to be playing uh, to to you know to those two up front. It's not going to be switching and doing that. Uh, you suspect that Asignon is going to come back in. That, yeah, that would be the people to do. Um, but it may be a case of he's just maybe a little bit more cautious up front. I don't know whether whether that's going to be the case or whether that's the Vincent Company way. Whether he's capable of doing that or whether we say, well, yeah, we're going to go. I mean, we we had did we almost have four forwards on at one point, didn't we? We on did, the... yeah. At the end of the game, we did. We had all four on, yeah. which was yeah, which is just unheard of. I I just find I find this new breed of Burnley Football Club just to be incredible. We had one winger or one one attacking outlet for about 10 years and now we we just got everybody's on the pitch at all the same time. It's really quite remarkable. Uh, finish off then with a score prediction, please, Adam. 2-1 Burnley. Yeah, well, I love it. Dave? Um, it's it's heart and head. Head, head says it's probably going to no, be no, a no, draw. No, ignore your head. Ignore your head. <laughs> What's your heart telling you? Right there, Dave. Um, there, where's your I'll, heart? I'll agree, I'll agree with Adam. I'll go for 2 1. Yes, two, one. look at this. We're blatantly manipulating Dave towards the end of the season. Our behaviour is appalling, Adam. Um, I'm going to say 2 0 to Burnley. I think Everton will struggle to score. I think Murich will have a blinder, and uh, I think the Clouts are going to win. Listeners, drop us your score predictions. You know how to get in touch. You can drop us lines on any of our social media channels, or you can email us at previewshow at nonandever.net. Dave, let's finish off this week's preview show, please, with a look at everybody's favourite feature, and that is the rating of Everton celebrity fans. And my goodness, do you have a corker for us this week? Uh, yeah, we've handpicked uh, a selection of six famous Everton fans for your consideration. Uh, they are, uh, in no particular order, uh, Tony Bellew, former world boxing champion, age 41. He was born in the Toxteth district of Liverpool in 1982 and was taken to his first match by his older brother, He's been a lifelong fan. He retired from boxing in 2018 and now has more time to watch his football. Uh, next is Tommy Fleetwood, professional golfer, age 33, uh, born in Southport. He's had a distinguished career as an amateur golfer before turning pro in 2010. Uh, he's won 10 tournaments and represented Europe in the Ryder Cup on three occasions, um, winning twice. Uh, Travelling the world playing golf means he doesn't get to Goodison Park as much as he'd like. Uh, but you may recall he's been a half-time guest there for a previous Burnley match. I think he was there back in 2017. Um, also, his caddy, Ian Finnis, is married to Burnley-born former Everton and England women's goalkeeper, Rachel Finnis-Brown. Ah, I did not know did this. You know? I did not know this. There you go. Some good, there's, there's some good connections this week. I think I, I should be having bonus points for uh, <laughs> connections. This week. You can have a second. Uh, another one coming up. Next up, John Parrott, former professional snooker player. Uh, he was a, a snooker pro from 1983 to 2010 and is now a snooker commentator and pundit at age 59. Uh, his dad took him to Goodison Park at the age of six and he's been a fan ever since. For an extra connection, he's also the brother-in-law of a former Everton striker and caretaker manager. That's because his wife's sister is married to none other than Duncan Ferguson. Dave, a quick pause there. Are we in danger of some restraining orders this week? Because we've gone way above <laughs> and beyond <laughs> what we're supposed to do. I know that I was scolding you a little bit for some very tenuous links. So, oh, my cat's woken up. Hello. Um, I know I've been um, scolding you some, for some very tenuous links, but this is this is getting a bit far now. I feel like we might be in trouble. Wait, wait for the last one. and then We've got another, Go another couple, and then the last one will bring us back into line. So. We, we don't earn enough for legal representation, Dave. We just don't. We don't earn anything on the podcast. Play along. Play along. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Ne next up. Next up is J uh, Dame Judy Dench, actress, oh. age 89. Uh, perhaps best known for a role as M in the James Bond film franchise. Dame Judy was born in York, but is a longtime Everton supporter, along with a late husband and also a grandson, Sam. Uh, she's also taken her involvement with the club a step further, becoming an honorary patron of his official charity, Everton in the Community. Yeah. Uh, the slightly younger end of the scale, 
Uh, is another actress, Jodie Comer, age 31, was born in Liverpool in, 1980, in 1993, and is probably best known for a portrayal of Villanelle in the BBC drama Killing Eve, which That's ran for three so series good. between 2018 and 2022. Yeah, I like that as well. Um, like many others growing up in Liverpool, she could have been a red or a blue. But in her case, she probably didn't have much choice in the matter, as her dad, Jimmy Comer, has been a masseur for Everton Football Club ever since the 1990s. That's a good How list. Do you like that? Uh, that's a really great list. And I am um, generally concerned about restraining orders. Um, and go, you, oh, you, oh, oh, and, and, go ahead. The, the best is still to come. Is that right? Uh, is there another? No, that, that's only five. So the sixth one, this feature wouldn't be what it is without a slight curveball. Oh, for in our goodness sake. I was all going so well as well. This time, this time, it's the turn of 77-year-old actor Sylvester Stallone and his credentials to be dismissed by you, Natalie. He would never claim to be a lifelong blue, but as well as filming at Goodison Park for his Creed film back in 2015, along with Tony Bellew, it was recalled that he'd been to Goodison Park before. Back in 2007, he was paraded on the pitch. He was a friend of club director at that time, Robert Earle. There was even a suggestion that he might invest in the club, even though nothing came of it in the end. No. No. You're not having that. I'm sorry. That's So we went from the very first season of Celebrity Fans that no, they had to be still living. Alive. They couldn't be animals. They couldn't be chairman. They couldn't be anything. All these ridiculous rules. Then it all went out of the window with a walking pie mascot at Wigan. And now we've got basically, if you wanted a ground tour, you and you're a Hollywood actor, then you're suddenly a lifelong fan. I'm not having that. Okay, Adam, let's bring some common sense to proceedings, please. Now this this list was was received quite favourably by the Non and Ever panel when we put it to them before the show. Um, some very strong scores there. Um, ignoring Sylvester Stallone, who I'm discounting just because it's a nonsense. What are you? What did you give? Tell our listeners what you gave score wise. Uh, so I gave an eight for this. I thought it was a really good list, uh, really good uh, sports sports people on there, a couple of world champions, Bellew and, and Parrot, I think he won one. Um, and I'm a big fan of Killing Eve as well, so um, Jordan Comer definitely boosts the so score good. for me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, really Judy, Judy Dench for me. Yeah, I, I went to drama school when I was younger and Judy Dench was literally like, God. Um, so she brings up, I actually went nine purely because of Judy Dench. So um, well, whereabouts were the team known and ever average scores? And Dave, where did we think of in the end? It was all around the eights, wasn't it? I think, yeah, we had a seven and a nine and then mostly eights. And I, I'd, I'd go along with that. I'd, I'd be looking around eight, I think. For yeah, this, this I'm thing. tempted to give them nine, but I do have to moderate in, in favour of the masses. Um, so I'm going to say they get an eight. Very strong, solid performance there, Everton fans. Your celebrity fans are impressive. Okay, let's wrap up then. Uh, Adam, I don't believe that we have much in terms of a FPL update this week because they we're in the middle of a game week, aren't we? So do we have anything to report? Uh, the only thing I've got to report is the March Manager of the Month award. Um, so we've got two uh, well, joint winners. Uh, so Tall Paul, who's done very well in the past. Friend of um, mine. Yeah, I think, yeah, I'm going to say, so you can you can get in touch with him. I will, um, I will give him a second. 248 points and um, joint top was Cove and Monday, um, one that I haven't heard of before, but yeah, also scoring 248 points, so well congratulations done both of you to both. Yeah, please yeah, get in touch. And, I'll no, give Paul his, I'm seeing Paul shortly anyway in the next tournament, so I'll give him a sticker then. I, I, he's probably won about 12 already, but he's getting another one. Um, and uh, okay. yeah, Cove, what was he called? Cove? A Monday. Cove a Monday. Please do get in touch for your celebratory manager of the month for March sticker. That is all we have time for, listeners. Dave, any... Oh, no, Dave. Adam, you've let Dave down. He came prepared with a prop. What are we saying ahead of this weekend's game to our listeners? Uh, yeah, so the next, the next deadline is Saturday the 6th of April at 11am. Um, and wishing you all green arrows, as always. Excellent. Up the, clarets. Up, the, up the clarets. Tell you, it's getting towards the end of the season, listeners. Fatigue is settling in. It's been a long old season. We're forgetting our scripts. Um, Dave, no community news that we need to pass on? I don't think there is, is there? No, I don't think so. Nothing for me to add there, no. No. The only other thing that we need to add is um, I know there's been quite a lot of discussions with this week's announcement of the season ticket 
um, increases and the prices for next season. Um, those of you who are not already aware, most of you will be. We have three members of None and Never on the Fan Advisory Board, myself, George and Charlotte. We were all at the meeting um, ahead of that announcement and listened to um, the information brought forward by the club. We're just talking to the club now to see what, if anything, we can uh, pass on to our listeners um, from that meeting. Obviously, some of it is confidential and is um, not able to be passed along in terms of much of what we discuss at the FAB, but we do have some things that we can discuss. So I'm just going to have a quick chat with Russell, um, our fan advisory uh, director, who can tell us what our parameters are. But we are hoping in the next few days to record a season ticket special where George, Charlotte and I just try and answer some of the questions come through from you as to why the season ticket prices have gone up, why there seems to be a difference in percentage increases and what this means for us going forward um, and try and pass some of that information along. So do keep an eye out for that. Hopefully we can bring you something. Uh, we'll pass it out as a special recording on um, on the podcast. We might even do it via a, um, a YouTube live. That might be the easier thing to do. Um, other than that, we will be back on Tuesday with our analysis show, hopefully talking about an incredibly important win away at Goodison Park and Park and maybe a step closer to an unbelievably great escape. Um, thank you to my colleagues, Adam and Dave, who've been with us on this previous show, to the rest of the team and producer Matt for um, all of their input in making this episode possible. Um, we'll be back for the preview show ahead of the next game next week on Friday night, as usual. Godspeed to all of our travelling clerics who are making their way to um, Everton. I was absolutely delighted for you at that point away at Chelsea. That's the one thing I want for our fans who've travelled across the country in, in the face of a difficult season and still showed up for our boys. Um, I would love for you to get that win. That would be fantastic. Um, to everybody else, stay safe until next time. I've been Nakla Bromley. This has been the preview show brought to you by the Known and Never podcast. Until next time. The Known and Never podcast is brought to you in association with the TalkSport Fan Network. Our host and editor is Natalie Bromley and the show is produced by Matt Moss. Our resident statistician is Dave Roberts and our FPL expert is Adam Dennett. The analysis show team is collectively Tom Whitaker, Rich Steele, George Poole, Charlotte Rigby and Adam Dennett. Our music is provided by George Gaskell and our newsletter team is headed up by Jamie Smith. If you don't already, you can subscribe to our newsletter by visiting nonenever.substack.com. Thanks as ever go to our partners TalkSport. We are proud to be associated with the TalkSport fan network.